Let's start this with a quiz. Who said, I'm a never Trump guy. I never liked him. Same guy also said, my God, what an idiot about Trump. Or he said, I find him reprehensible. And then finally, finally, in a email to a uh, former law school roommate, quote, I go back and forth between thinking Trump is a cynical asshole or that he's America's Hitler. <laughs> um, all of those, that is, uh, that is uh, J.D. Vance. Uh, that was J.D. Vance in 2016 uh, on Twitter, in interviews, and in this uh, uh, private Facebook post that he sent to his uh, former roommate uh, that was published. I could have said any one of them. That is absolutely true. I, I, I think, I, you know, probably other than the last one, I've never said anything like... He's America's Hitler. I've never thought he had the capacity to be America's Hitler. I do think he's a cynical ale. But, um, uh, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of bad things about him. So any one of these others could have been me. But no, this is J.D. Vance, the guy who is now uh, vice president to uh, vice president candidate, soon to be vice president, to uh, Donald Trump. Uh, this is now Donald Trump's biggest ally, biggest promoter, biggest cheerleader. All in a span of eight years, uh, this conversion has happened. And uh, I think this is indicative of, of uh, J.D. Vance. Uh, he, um, he is willing to change. He's willing to change his mind about things. And in this case, he has uh, dramatically changed his mind about uh, Donald Trump gone from being very, very, very skeptical of Donald Trump to being, again, his, uh, his biggest supporter. I think that's one of his uh, characteristics. What caused him to, um, uh, to change his mind about Trump? Uh, it, I mean, certainly during 2016, he was very anti-Trump and he didn't vote for Trump in 2016. Uh, and... Uh, I, 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 as, as, as J.D. Vance describes it, right, uh, he, he started to see, uh, he, he, he started to um, um, uh, question kind of uh, the, the, the values of uh, Republicans and the people who supported Republicans, the conventional Republicans. And he describes it as a slow process, a slow process of shifting from uh, what he would call, I think, a conventional Republican perspective to a, a, a kind of a, a radical perspective, or not a radical perspective, but to a populist, a populist Republican perspective, which he now holds, which he uh, has, has embraced uh, Donald Trump. If you were cynical, you would say he recognized where the power really lay in the Republican Party as he prepared to uh, make a run for the Senate in Ohio, which he did in 2022, and he won the seat. After he went, apologized, kissed the ring, uh, backtracked to Donald Trump personally, and won his endorsement uh, for the Senate. Uh, but what's, what's interesting about him is, uh, you know, maybe if we go back to his history a little bit, uh, J.D. Vance was born in Ohio, not far from the Appalachian Mountains. He's very much associated with the kind of Appalachians as a region, primarily because he wrote a, a very successful book called Hillbilly Elegy. The Hillbilly Elegy was a description of his own life uh, in the Appalachian. He had a, a mother who was a drug addict. He had a father who had abandoned them when he was still a toddler. Uh, and he was really raised by his grandparents, and, and he found inspiration in his grandmother. His grandmother was really the, the person kind of behind that pushed him uh, to, to be successful and to break out of kind of the, the what would you call it, the kind of the, the, the poor, the, the, the poverty-stricken 
kind of cycle of dependence, welfare, failure, failure at everything. And in the book, he was very honest about this. And one of the things he does in this book, and the book is quite powerful, and there was a movie made, I guess, from the book. One of the things he does in the book uh, is describe how uh, these poor whites, and primarily whites, but uh, I'm sure other uh, uh, these poor whites, this, this is uh, not unique to whites, um, basically, uh, basically allowed themselves to be caught up in this trap of living at other people's expense, welfare, and uh, thinking only short-term and satisfying short-term desires, whether through alcohol or drugs, and not being willing to take responsibility for their own lives and escape their poverty. It was a very powerful book embraced by, uh, I think, a lot of conservatives, uh, he was hailed by the conservative movement. He was hailed by what you would consider conventional Republicans as basically calling out the poor as, as not taking personal responsibility. The book is really about the lack of personal responsibility, starting with his mother and the whole community around him. And one of the things that makes him unique and one of the things he describes that makes him unique, and he gave, gives credit to his grandmother for, for helping him achieve this, is breaking out of that. He, um, he graduates with good grades, but he doesn't want to go to college because he doesn't think he's disciplined enough to attend college. Again, that pretty, pretty good self-awareness for an 18-year-old. So he enlists in the Marines. He serves one tour of duty in Iraq. Uh, he then goes, uh, goes and gets an undergraduate, undergraduate uh, I think, is it in, uh, is it in, uh, from Purdue? Um, he, he, you know, he gets an undergraduate degree in two years. Uh, uh, you know, super fast because the guy is super brilliant. I mean, one thing about J.D. Vance that is clear is that he is brilliant. He is really smart. He's really smart. By the way, Vance is a name that he and his wife picked. Uh, it's his maternal grandparents' family name. His father, as we said, abandoned him. He was born uh, James Donald Bowman. Uh, so he, he didn't want the Bowman name. He then took on his stepfather's name, but his stepfather, name, his stepfather left at some point. Um, he, uh, he, uh, he changed Donald to David because Donald was his biological father's name, again, distancing himself from his biological father. So today he is, uh, you know, JD, which is what he's been, his nickname, I guess, uh, since he was a boy. It's James David Vance, Vance again, a name that he and his wife picked, basically, uh, in honor of his maternal grandparents. Uh, so he went to, he went to undergraduate, uh, was obviously uh, Ohio State University, sorry, not Purdue. He went to Ohio State University, where he did the whole thing in two years. He then got accepted to Yale Law School, not easy, and many, many a president of the United States of America has gone to Yale Law School. It seems to be the factory for producing um, a president. Uh, he went to Yale Law School where he met his, uh, his, his wife. His wife is interesting. Uh, his wife is uh, actually, um, was brought up Hindu. Uh, she comes from uh, Indian, uh, parents are Indian, Hindus. Uh, if she has any religion, it's Hindu as far as we can tell. She uh, has, has, has not, you know, so, so that's interesting. In, in, in just the, the kind of the Christian nationalism sense, which we'll get to, uh, which we'll get to uh, uh, later. Um, and then from Yale Law School, I think he, he got to know Peter Thiel while he was at Yale and uh, went to work for Peter Thiel, the venture capitalist in California. And then he came back to Ohio and worked for venture capitalist as a venture capitalist in Ohio, not for Thiel's firm, for another firm. He was quite successful, made some good money there. The book, uh, Hillbilly Elegy, was a bestseller, so he made money from that. Uh, and um, he, uh, he has then um, 
you know, he, he then ran, as we said, for the Senate in 2022 and won after being endorsed uh, by Trump and after really embracing Trump's ideas. Um, he, he became very, uh, for example, became very, very anti-immigration right off the bat. Uh, let's see, uh, 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 what else did I want to say? Yeah, just about his wife, uh, some other interesting things about his wife. Uh, she, was, um, she was at Yale Law School with him, and she actually clerked for, uh, she worked for Kavanaugh, and she clerked, I think, for uh, the Chief Justice. So she has clerked in the Supreme Court. So she obviously, uh, you know, another kind of superstar uh, when it comes to brains and, 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 and super smart. Uh, she grew up in San Diego, born in the United States to Indian Hindu uh, parents. All right, a few things about uh, Vance. Uh, Vance holds very much a, you know, left leftist view when it comes to uh, to economics. Um, he he says uh, he has a lot more in common. I, I, you know, he, he write, he, he, this is from an interview with him. He says, the people on the left, I would say, whose politics I'm open to, people on the left whose politics I'm open to, it's the Bernie bros. That's Bernie Sanders. But generally, he continues, center-left liberals who are doing very well and center-right conservatives who are doing very well have an incredible blind spot about how much their success is built on a system that is not serving people they should be serving, who they should be serving. So from an economic perspective, and generally attitudinally in terms of, I think, economics and business and so on, he is much more sympathetic to the Bernie bros, to uh, supporters of Bernie Sanders, than he would be to, um, again, center-left, center-right. He's very critical of economists. He says economists have no clue about tariffs. He says economists have no clue about uh, the, the, uh, the effect of, um, of, of tariffs on the economy. He also claims economists have no clue about things like minimum wage. He's very pro, for example, uh, significant higher minimum wages. He talks about a $20 minimum wage uh, having all these beneficial positive effects. And generally, his whole economic agenda, if you can think about his economic perspective, his economic attitude is to drive up wages of Americans, primarily drive up wages of um, working class Americans. And, and, and he thinks you do that by basically two ways you do that. One, tariffs. That is, you just restrict the amount of goods coming into the United States so that Americans have to make stuff in America, build stuff in America, and therefore have to employ people. And then dramatically restrict immigration, particularly at the low level of employment, particularly to, for the working class. And that basically creates a crunch for businessmen because they don't have enough workers. They can't hire immigrants. They can't hire overseas. They have to, they have to then find a way to, 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 they have to hire Americans. And then if you say to J.D. Vance, but look, unemployment is really, really low, and uh, uh, where are you going to find these workers? He'd say, look, there's 9 million people who are sitting on the sidelines, uh, young people, employable people, who, who are chose, choosing to be in their mother's basement. Make it profitable for them to come and work. Now, many of us might say, yeah, you make that profitable for them to come and work by stop giving them uh, welfare, by stop coddling them by stop a lot of things. But his attitude is, no, you, 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 you incentivize them to come to work by offering them significantly higher wages. So he wants to help the working class by raising the wages of the working class significantly, significantly. And again, to do that, you tax imports, 
which of course makes it, you, you know, uh, 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 drives the incentives for people to manufacture in the United States or to do, to build and create stuff in the United States. And two, uh, you uh, reduce immigration dramatically. Now that's ignorant on so many fronts. And of course he knows this. So he says, economists don't understand. Economists don't get it. Economists, uh, you know, are wrong. Now, he's too smart to believe that, I think. I mean, I, and I wonder. I wonder. Now, he's also very pro deregulation sometimes. But then, for example, you remember when the uh, chemical, uh, the train with the chemicals derailed in Palestine, Ohio? He bitterly complained about not enough regulations on, air, on, on railroads and that we need more regulations on railroads. And he sponsored a bill to increase regulation on railroads. And he blamed the lack of regulations on. For, 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 for the, the accident. So he's for reducing regulations and barriers to business, but not too much and not in places where it might. Um, the reality is, the reality is that tariffs hurt the poor more than anybody else. Who do you think buys stuff from China? Do I? I mean, and I'm, I'm not, you know, the, the, the most of you, I mean, I'm sure some of the stuff here is made in China, but most of it's not. Um, but not just China, imports generally. Americans, Walmart, people who shop at Walmart. One of the reasons, one of the things that made Walmart so successful, and one of the things that made, made Amazon so successful is they've nailed the supply chain down. They've nailed logistics down. They can produce in China, ship at very low costs, and sell to Americans. So it's Walmart, it's Amazon, and where the most working class American shop? It's Target. They shop at these places. So the, um, you raise tariffs, you raise costs, because you just can't build it cheaper in the United States. And if, if indeed wages go up, then Americans are going to have to pay more for the stuff that those higher priced employees are going to deliver. So prices across the entire economy go up, which who, who, who primarily suffers from that? It's the working class. So good prices go up when you raise tariffs. I mean, that's pretty obvious. Americans start paying if, if the, if the, if the, foreign goods still flow into the United States and there's a tariff on them, then Americans start paying a higher tariff, a, a tax, a sales tax on everything that comes in. And if Americans take over all the goods that have come in from China, manufacturing them here, higher price for that. So all tariffs do is raise the cost of living in the United States. They make it more expensive to live in the U.S. Who suffers the most from cost of living increases? The working class and the poor do. Now, what about immigration? Well, study after study after study show that immigration raises wages. Now, it doesn't necessarily raise the wages of the people whose jobs these immigrants maybe in some cases are taking over. Although most immigrants who are coming in, including illegal immigrants, are filling jobs that Americans don't want to do. So in some cases, look, yes, wages are going down. But overall, other wages are going up. The reality is that immigrants don't just work 
And they also consume, which means they create demand for goods, which increases the production of those goods that they now demand, which creates economic activity, which provides profits and wages to other people. And generally, when immigrants come in, wages overall rise. Employment overall rises. It doesn't go down. Wages generally, you know, uh, uh, go up with immigration. It's been shown over and over and over again. Indeed, at some point, I was going to show you a video of J.D. Vance uh, uh, questioning uh, Powell, the Fed chairman, about the relationship between immigration and um, immigration and wages. And I, I might still show you that because it's interesting. But it's just... It's, it's J.D. Vance is just wrong on this, these issues. Powell, unfortunately, does not, does not, doesn't want to get into it, so he doesn't correct him. But J.D. Vance is just wrong on this, and he's too smart not to know that he's wrong on it. So Vance is very much a economic leftist, an economic leftist, and right wing. On culture, certainly on immigration, he's very anti-immigration. He wants skill-based immigration, so he wants those green cards for Silicon Valley. Uh, he, he's got a lot of friends in Silicon Valley. He was and has been Trump's kind of lead guy in getting Silicon Valley on board in supporting Trump. In supporting Trump. Uh, what else can we say about, oh yeah, one other thing about his economics, I will say. Um, uh, let me just see. No, that's not the story. Where's the story I wanted? So all I need is the headline. Yeah, there it is. Headline, I think I actually talked about this a few months ago, uh, or maybe a year ago. Uh, this is from, uh, yeah, July 2023, so exactly a year ago. Headline of a newspaper story, and the title is the new the new power couple taking on Wall Street. The new power couple taking on Wall Street. Uh, in other words, embracing a bill that would that would uh, regulate big banks and very much in favor of small banks relative to big banks, but generally buying into the idea that big banks are bad for America. Who are they? J.D. Vance and Elizabeth Warren. J.D. Vance and Elizabeth Warren are considered the power couple, Washington, D.C. power couple taking on Wall Street. Now, what's interesting is the Democrats have assigned Elizabeth Warren as their point person to go after J.D. Vance as of yesterday when he was uh, nominated as the VP, maybe because she knows him. But she's worked very close with him. She had very nice things to say about him. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, he and uh, Josh Hawley are two of the Republicans most likely to have bills co-sponsored with regard to economic issues, co-sponsored with Democrats. So he's the most Democratic of the Republican senators, him and Josh Hawley, which is not when it comes to economic issues, which is not surprising. Uh, on abortion, uh, J.D. Vance is, is conservative, so he's uh, very anti-abortion. He, um, he uh, uh, advocates for a 15-week um, national ban, although he's dropped that, given, uh, given that he was, he, he was given his affiliation with Trump. He's basically done, he, he's basically succumbed to Trump's request not to deal with abortion, uh, and he's adopted this idea of every state should do what they want, right? What other issues? Um, you know, in his 2022 campaign, just going back to, uh, to immigration quickly, it, immig you know, his first ad, his first ad was basically, was basically a, a, just him speaking to the camera, 
where he says Joe Biden's open border is killing Ohioans with more illegal drugs and more Democrat voters pouring into this country. So his first ad in 2022 played full on into the uh, kind of the, the, the populist fears of immigrants, uh, both in terms of crime, in terms of drugs, and in terms of Democratic voters are coming across. across. Um, uh, Vance supports the wall and finishing the wall. He opposes all amnesty, any form of amnesty, and he wants what's called, a, as we said, a, a um, skill-based, uh, generally, yeah, we talked about that. Uh, let's see a few other issues quickly. And, and uh, Ukraine, he's very anti-U.S. support for Ukraine. Uh, he believes the United States should stop supporting Ukraine, uh, that should cut a deal with the Russians ASAP. Uh, he, he, he views freeze the border as it is right now, cut a deal with, uh, with, um, with Putin uh, to, to agree not to expand any further, to end the war, and uh, the United States should provide Ukraine with weapons necessary to defend itself if Russia changes its mind, but otherwise the U.S. is out, and basically reward Putin for his aggression by giving him everything that Russia has conquered to date. Now, what is going to be fascinating and horrific, I think, is, is that this is not going to be American foreign policy. That both uh, Trump and, uh, and J.D. Vance are, are, are pro-Russia now. And uh, we're going to get a whole pro-Russian foreign policy when it comes to Europe. It means, oh, the commitment the United States will make and Ukraine will make is to Ukrainian neutrality. J.D. Vance says, yeah, I know Trump, you know, Russia wants more than just neutrality, but that'll be the compromise. We'll give them neutrality and they'll stop the war. Really scary, I think. And again, this is the future of the Republican Party. This is not, you can't view this as, okay, just J.D. Vance and who cares about vice president, it doesn't matter. He's young, he's 40 years old. He'll be, I think, the second youngest VP ever. I told you when he was elected to the Senate that he and Joth Hawley are the future of the Republican Party. I told you that the two of them are the most dangerous senators in America. I didn't expect it to happen so quickly. I, two years ago, I did not think he would become Trump's VP candidate and, and with almost a should path in. Very pro-Israel. Very pro-Israel. Um, part of his explanation for the difference is Ukraine can't beat Russia. Israel can beat Hamas. So we should support a winner. I don't know how serious he takes that. Uh, but oh, Tucker Carlson loves this guy. Loves this guy. Uh, let's see. He's good on energy. He's good on climate change. Uh, Trump is good on energy. Trump is good on climate change. Um, yeah, he said about Israel, Israel has an achievable objective. Ukraine does not. That, that's how partially he explains his support for Israel and his lack of support for Ukraine. Of course, y Ukraine's goal is unachievable if it doesn't get the appropriate support uh, from the U.S., in other words, what we have with Trump and Vance is we have, I don't know, democratic populism. We have big spending, entitlement loving, tariffs, market skepticism, conspiratorial isolationism, socially conservative, and hateful of immigrants. That's the new Republican Party. That's what this convention is all about. And, um, yep, it's, you know, and, and basically Trump has solidified that by this choice that this is, this is what the Republican Party is all about. 
Let me just say one more thing about J.D. Vance and religion, because I think this is super significant. J.D. Vance was raised Christian, some form of evangelical Protestant, something like that. But he says that, you know, when he went to school, maybe even as a Marine, he was an atheist. He became an atheist. He said he was, came back to religion partially inspired by Peter Thiel. For those of you who don't know, Peter Thiel is a, I think, Catholic, gay, Christian. Um, and so he became a Christian partially inspired by Peter Thiel. And he converted to Catholicism, Catholicism, in 2019 as an adult. So this is not a casual Christian. This is not just somebody who was raised Christian. This is somebody who converted to it. In uh, 2023, when Christian nationalism was brought up, he dismissed the term as meant to be very scary. But then he went on to explain that he envisaged Christianity informing American life, importantly. So I'm going to quote from what he said. We're a country that is a majority Christian, nominally, but not nearly majority Christian in terms of practice. We're a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious democracy that's heavily exposed to the economic forces of globalization. And I think we have not yet figured out how to harmonize that with some basic sense of what it means to be an American in the 21st century. I happen to think that the Christian faith is a good way of helping provide an answer to that question. He says, quote, part of social conservatism's challenge for viability in the 21st century is that it can't just be about issues like abortion. But it has to have a broader vision, a political economy, and the common good. He has been associated not so much with, uh, you know, the uh, national conservatives, but he's been associated with the much worse, much more principled, much more ideological, much more intellectual, Integralists, integralists. These are the Catholics who want to turn America into a Christian state, who want to use Christianity, who want to use government, sorry, to infuse our culture with Catholic values and with Christian morality. This is not your, you know, once in a while go to church kind of Christian. And I don't know how much he believes. But this is somebody who, you know, who really does, uh, who really does, I think, believe that Christianity is a political tool. Um, yep, so that, that, is, that is who he is. And it is interesting, right? Here's a guy who was called, basically called Trump, America's Hitler, who then became a huge fan of Trump, somebody who became an atheist and then a Christian and then converted to Catholicism. Here's a guy who changes his mind, but changes his mind in ways that are setting himself up for power, for influence. Um, I don't know. Uh, his wife is not Christian, according to the stories I've read, which is interesting. I wonder what kind of influence she has on him. Of course, she's also a, a daughter of immigrants. Um, don't know. 
it, it, it is interesting. It would be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see what power she has uh, on him.